John, in your book, you quote an article that reminds us that both British Airways and Air France had the whole supersonic field to themselves. With that in mind, do you think we did the best we could with that advantage? I think so. I mean, I'm not going to speak for Air France. I think British Airways, to start with, didn't want the aeroplanes. I mean, back in 1975, 1976, it was a nationalised airline and basically what happened was the British government just said to BOAC, here are seven Concords, you are going to take them. And the management of BOAC at that time said, we don't know what to do with an aeroplane like this. Doesn't, they were only interested in sort of bums on seats and mass travel and a premium product like that just didn't fit into their corporate thinking at all. But, you know, they were compelled to take it on. And the first few years of the Concorde operation was very touch and go as to, you know, whether or not it was going to work. Mm. It was largely thanks to the drive of a chap called Captain Brian Walpole, who absolutely campaigned vigorously for a change in attitude in the corporate management of the uh, of corporate thinking of the airline, ably assisted by a chap who subsequently went on to become uh, flight operations director um, in British Airways, although at that time he was a first officer, a chap called Jock Lowe, who will be a name that's known to many people. Mm -hmm. And those two between them really sort of drove the Concorde project forwards. But it wasn't, it wasn't until the airline was privatised and John King subsequently to become Lord King of Wartnaby. It wasn't until he arrived on the scene that Concord really came into its own. And one of the first things he did was to say to Brian Walpole, look, I, you can put your money where your mouth is. You've been going on and on about Concord and how it can make money. We'll set up Concord as an operating division in its own right in in British Airways, and you see what whether whether you can make it work. And it did. And the key milestone, I suppose, was clearance into New York. And the first flight into New York was in uh, November nineteen seventy seven. And that ended up as two scheduled services a day, the Speedbird 1 and the Speedbird 3. One left at 10.30 in the morning, the other 7 o'clock in the evening. And that was the bread and butter of the whole Concorde operation. British Airways, having got this completely transformed corporate management led by Lord King and Colin Marshall, um, they were willing to develop the Concorde into all sorts of areas. And we ended up going to places like Toronto. We went to Barbados on a regular basis. Um, we did round the world flights all, and charter flights. Um, and it was a highly successful operation and very, very profitable for the airline because what people tend to overlook is that British Airways never actually paid for those aeroplanes. They paid a sort of token sum of money as a transactional thing to acquire these seven aeroplanes. So they never had to write off the capital cost of seven Concorde. That hulls. probably would have brought the airline down. Oh, <laughs> absolutely. Probably would have done because who knows. It was a what, humongous amount of money. Yeah, humongous amount of money. So Really, basically, my attitude has always been that British Airways was simply the custodian of those seven Concords on behalf of us, 
the taxpayer. Interesting. And I love it. Having, but having acquired those aeroplanes on that basis, with that new management in place, that gave a completely fresh drive to the whole way the aeroplane, the whole way the airline operated, not just Concorde. And it was they made it. They created an airline that I was very, very proud to work for, and I think everybody who worked in British Airways in the sort of mid to late eighties, they really felt that they were working for an airline that was pretty damn special, I can tell you. Um, so I think the answer to the question is that British Airways certainly, once we got this new team of management in place, did exploit that airplane to the full amount that it was possible to exploit it. Because you have to remember that it could only fly over oceans or over deserts. It wasn't cleared for f supersonic overflight over populated areas. Mm. And you couldn't fly it subsonic for any length of time. Flying Concorde subsonic was a disaster. You lost about 30 to 40 percent of your range. Oh, wow. Flying at subsonic speeds. Mm. It was a vehicle that was designed for one thing and one thing only, and that was to fly at twice the speed of sound. It's interesting. Had Boeing managed to create a, an equivalent uh, uh, and the Russians TU 144, had that turned out to be a much more successful aircraft, do you think that would have, in the end, helped Concorde? Because the market would have been now quite impressive for uh, supersonic transport around the world. Well, I think if Boeing had produced one, it could well have done, because here, are, here, here is a, an element of cynicism, I'm afraid. I, I think there wouldn't have been any problem if it had been a Boeing supersonic airline, for it to have a supersonic corridor east to west across the United States. No, I think you're probably right. But who are we to say? Who are we to say? <laughs> well, suffice to say the SR-71 used to fly at supersonic speeds over the Interesting. mainland United States. Mm -hmm. The space shuttle, when it came in from space, was always supersonic as it came in towards uh, Kennedy Space Center. So, you know, there we are. Yes. I so mustn't be cynical about the Americans, <laughs> though, because I can tell you that the New Yorkers absolutely love Concord. Took them a bit of convincing, though, didn't it? But once they were convinced, they yeah. were on board 100, 150%. Well, I, I have to agree, yeah. Now, I found it fascinating, some of your stories of the passengers on board, because I always associated bad behavior and uh, incidents with uh, low-cost carriers. But there you are on Concorde with a mad lady and a Swiss army knife. I know, I know. Absolutely bonkers. <laughs> Going around stabbing people. <laughs> yeah, so it, it wasn't it just uh, the Ryanairs of this world. No, no. I've actually had somebody arrested as well. So oh, really? Tell yeah, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we're about to start up at Heathrow, and the chief steward comes up and says, I've got a bit of a problem, Captain. And I said, what's the problem? He said, this chap's refusing to extinguish his cigarette and refusing to drop his seatbelt. So I said, oh, dear, I'd better come back and see him, sir get out of my seat, go to the wardrobe, put on my jacket, put on my hat, march down the cabin. There's this chap sitting there, all strapped in, good as gold. And I just went up to him. I said very politely, oh, thank you very much, sir. Delighted to see you've strapped yourself in. We can get on our way. He unstrapped himself, stood up, pulled a pack of cigarettes out of his pocket, stuck one in his mouth, lit it up and blew smoke all over me. <laughs> so I said, oh, I see. I said, I'm terribly sorry, so I'm not going to be taking you. And I went off the airplane. I said to the dispatcher, could you get the police here, please? And the police sergeant and two constables arrived. And we went down in line astern, down the length of the airplane, back to where this chap was sitting. And once again, he's sitting there, all strapped in there, and no sign of a cigarette. 
and the policeman, police sergeant, asked the passenger to unstrap himself and and get ready to get off the aeroplane. And this chap says, well, I'm doing what I'm told. I've got the seat belts fastened and, and, you know, I've extinguished my cigarette. No, 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 said the police sergeant. You don't understand. The captain isn't actually going to take you. And I could see at this stage some doubt creeping into this police sergeant's face you know it was sort of my word against this passenger's word and he was beginning to feel a bit uncomfortable but anyway he stuck with it and he put his hand on this passenger's shoulder and said come on sir we'll get your cabin bags we'll get the cabin crew to take that off and as he put his hand on this chap's shoulder he rounded on this police sergeant and said take your effing hands off me or I'll thump your face in. <laughs> Whereupon the police sergeant got a very benign expression on his face and he started rocking to and fro on his balls of his feet to his heels and he said oh dear oh dear oh dear he said threatening a police officer in the course of his duty. He said I'm terribly sorry sir you're under arrest. <laughs> <laughs> so he was then frog marched off with these two police constables um, later to appear in Uxbridge Magistrates Court where he was fined for a considerable sum of money for disrupting a flight. Excellent. There's a nice tail piece to the story however. About six months later a letter finally got through to me. It was addressed to the Captain Speedbird 1 uh, London Heathrow Airport, you know, it's sort of rather sort of vague addressing and eventually it worked its way through British Airways internal mail system and got to me and it was a letter from this passenger and it was apologising for his behaviour. Oh really? He, oh, wow. he was um, on medication for some medical condition He'd been told not to combine drinking with that medication. He had been drinking because he was a nervous passenger. And that concoction, that cocktail mix of booze with the medication is what triggered off this irrational behaviour. And he said, I just wanted to apologise and tell you what it was that lay behind it. He said, I'm not normally like that. Interesting. So he had the grace to apologise.